So actually, that will be like my first question for you, Khalil, is the anxiety. Because you talk about it so openly. Yeah. Where do you feel... Where does... Well, first off, I want to say, if, if you don't know Khalil's story already, there's plenty of information, books, where you can go read about it. And I know we're going to touch on it for sure. Sure. Um, but for you, where does most of your anxiety come from? Where does most of my anxiety You know, just the first from? normal question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I've always been wired on the anxious and depressive side. Mm. It's just how I've always been since I was a little kid. I was, I was pretty morbid and melancholy um, from as far back as I can remember. Mm. I was, well, starting with my third birthday. And when I say my third birthday, I'm not one of those weirdos that has those incredible memories where they remember being born and all that stuff. I don't remember any of that shit. Mm -hmm. But I, but I do remember, I do remember two, well, three things going from two until three. Um, there were two movies, 80 Days Around the World was one of them. And it's a mad, mad, mad world. I remember specifically sitting in front of the television, watching both of them, loving them because they made me laugh. Mm. I really needed to laugh. I was a really sad kid. And there was a lot of violence going on at that time and a lot of dysfunction and neglect and abuse. And then I remember my third birthday. And mm. I remember it like it was yesterday. In fact, that's what Kimmy and I were dealing with. Yesterday. Yesterday. In your bodywork session for people who have no context. Yeah. Kimmy <laughs> is, uh, is a healer here in Austin, Texas. And I got on her table and she has this amazing way of tapping into exactly how you feel. Mm. And she very specifically said, you know, you're dealing with some stuff from your much, much earlier self. Um, you know, this is your three-year-old self and blah, blah, blah. And can we go into there and can we explore this feeling? And I was not in the mood. I did not want to go into that. I kind of want to just do my stretching and get about my day. This yep. is a really busy month for me. And she kept encouraging me to breathe and go into those feelings and um, mm -hmm. I had done that spray, the MitoZen um, Hape spray. And it just, er everything just hit me at once. And I, and I was able to tap into that. And um, man, I cried. And I kept trying not to cry. And I just kept crying harder. And I laid there and I, and I, I was really, really in touch with how I felt back then. So my anxiety and being depressed comes from a childhood filled with neglect and violence and abuse of all sorts. And the way that I am now is light years from how I used to be. So literally like light years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like most young men, I didn't even know how I felt like most men. How about that? I didn't know how I felt. Uh -huh. I was just this ball of anger and lust and um, yeah, just darkness, depression. I was just a <clears throat> I was just a ball of um of discontent. So when I became old enough to act out to to you know to learn that like, oh well, I can smash a window and I don't feel like me or I can shoplift a Hot Wheels car and I don't feel like me or I can go hang out with the older kids and sneak some weed or, or drink some of the warm beers in the basement from my beer can collection. Um, there would be those temporary moments of reprieve from this overwhelming, all-consuming anxiety and fear that mm. lurked beneath the surface that I wasn't in touch with, mm -hmm. but I was the I was the recipient of it. As you're uh, like ingrained in your nervous system for yeah. sure. Yeah, and 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 also um, epige epigenetic imprinting for sure. My my dad beat my mom um, while I was in the womb as well, so mm. I was born early. Um, so whatever she was feeling, whatever trauma she was feeling. I was also feeling so epigenetic imprinting and then just a really fucking horrible childhood. Um, 
set the stage to create me how I am. And here I am 52 years later, or here I am at 52 years old, still undoing it, still unpacking it, still peeling back the layers of the onion and learning how to exercise, not exercise, but <laughs> exercise it uh -huh. from, from my being, from my soul. I mean, as I laid on her table yesterday, crying and shaking, I literally was like, like pulling stuff, like just pulling stuff out of me and like throwing it away. And mm. she's so great. She just sat there silently. She didn't patronize me. She didn't try to be a part of it to make herself look cool. Like I, if someone was having a transformative experience in front of me, like I was in front of her, I would, I, knowing me, I would want to have, I would want to jump in in some way. I would want to like put a hand on the shoulder mm -hmm. or I would want to say things like, oh, you're doing great. And I'm so glad we're on this journey together. <laughs> like, uh -huh. I would want some validation from that because I'm that needy and insecure. She's so whole mm. in her goddess self that I couldn't even find her in the room as I was mm. going through it. I kept thinking like, God, is she going to tell me to like move on at a certain point? Or is she going to like say something i didn't i don't mean like in a bad way i just meant like i don't know i i've seen a lot of healers i've seen a lot of healers i lived in la for 29 years i've seen a lot of fake healers <laughs> so-called healers mm -hmm. and whatever um and shaman and cranial sacral and this and that um she's just the real deal she is mm. a goddess she's she's uh she's an angel She's an angel and she was there to heal me. And we're angels as well. And the people listening are angels. And that is what came to me on the table yesterday was that we all came from someplace else and we're here to evolve. We're here to kind of experience all of this that God has created. There's a lot of temptations and there's a lot of, uh, we were given free will. And when you're, when you're given free will, you know, the, the gluttony or the lust or the greed or the anger or whatever can, can creep in. And if we're not self-aware, if we don't realize that we are, we are part angel and we're part beast, that's sort of the great cosmic joke, right? We're part angel stuck in these bestial meat suits. Mm-hmm with instincts and desires um, and an ego, which then really fucks things up. <laughs> um, and we can, we can evolve and we can get better or we can go the opposite way. I, I, I think maybe it's possible to remain stagnant for a short period of time, but it seems to me like I'm either evolving and getting better and ascending towards the light or I'm falling back into the darkness. It's not mm. really a whole lot of room where you can just grab on and hang on and sit and be sedentary. Mm. You're really evolving and going towards the light or you're going back towards the darkness in my experience. Mm. So when you, when you think back or feel into where the layers that you've already uncovered, when you talk about that anxiety and fear, which is an absolute real thing when you talk about epigenetics what's in your subconscious mind in your nervous system it's literally programmed into you mm -hmm. what have what have you like discovered or uncovered in like what is that what does that fear mean or saying that what is it trying to protect you from well that there that there's some unknown thing that's going to cause great harm um that whatever is good is going to go away. Mm. So when I was a child, there were other angels like Kimmy that came into my life briefly. One of them was Greg Huffman. He was my neighbor that lived um, five houses down. And I was like four years old and he was 14 years old. And Greg, you, you and Greg actually looked Similar, similar. <laughs> but his eyes were a much brighter blue. He had uh -huh. like these really bright blue eyes. And um, Greg protected me from a, from a multitude of, of things. Um, and very like real, like 
he was protecting me. He wasn't like giving me reassurance by his presence. He physically protected me. Mm. Um, and I loved him and I looked up to him. And he had to have emergency open heart surgery when he was 14 years old and he died on the operating table. Whoa. And I was four years old when that happened. And I couldn't wrap my head around it. And there was another older woman. We called her Aunt Elsie. She wasn't really my aunt. Um, I was close to her for a brief moment, sort of like in a babysitting capacity. capacity and, um, and she died. And then as I got older, um, there was a guy named Tommy who was kind of like the janitor, kind of like the night watchman at this country club that was behind my house. And I really looked up to Tommy and I would go and hang out at the country club where he worked. And um, I became very close to Tommy. And he was on a ladder, I don't know, cleaning some windows or changing a light bulb. And he fell off the ladder and he died. So those experiences were horrifying and traumatic. And that's part of the fear and the anxiety that if there is something good, that it's going to go away. Yeah, that's like, well, first, I appreciate you sharing. I know you've shared a lot, but it still doesn't, like, I still just want to tell you, like, I appreciate you for sharing, like, so much. Thank you. Like... So how do you, how does that translate to now 52-year-old Khalil? Where you do have so many beautiful things and you've come light years of, you have this, you know, beautiful business that is giving back to people, like truly in like health and wealth to yourself, relationship, friends, now home. Do you feel like that's where part of that, like the anxiety pops up? Or how does it feel like as an adult now with that fear of losing good things? Well, I mean, to go, to become such a horrific drug addict, IV Mm -hmm. drug user, and to go through what I went through, which I put myself through. Nobody did that. You know, I used to think that like, I shot heroin because my mom didn't love me or or, uh, because I was abandoned or because, you know, I was abused. Um, it's part of it, but it's not reality. I shot heroin and smoked crack because it felt great. And you still I'm, chose to. I chose to. I'm selfish. Mm-hmm. Um, that that dawned on me in in early 2000 when I was trying to kick for the 50th time. I was trying to kick heroin and I was on my sofa and I was just, oh, I was just. You go, you turn colors and you Mm -hmm. puke and you shit and your nose is constantly running and everything hurts and everything's loud. And I was laying on the sofa, just trying to just drown myself in mind numbing television. And at that time, E E News or E Network, whatever, Mm -hmm. did a lot of these like documentary type shows. And this one came on about Oprah. And I had all these preconceived notions about Oprah, you know, like, oh, you know, whatever, like smart, smart girl came from like some rich family and like had an uncle that worked in the entertainment industry. Like I had a whole script of how she got to be a billionaire and, you know, be in the position that she was in. And I watched a documentary laying there dying, hearing about how you know, she got raped by her own uncle and she was sexually abused over and over again. She was pregnant, I think at 13, um, grew up at a time when being black in this country was really, truly a strike against you. Um, and, and weight issues, you know, body, you know, she had a body that was not like a thin body, Mm -hmm. body that was, I don't know what the word is, ectomorph, endomorph, whatever it is, but you know, she was, As we used to say, big boned, uh, she had a frame that was large and she was black and she struggled with her weight and she had all of this trauma and horrible shit happened to her and she was born super poor and it showed the story of how she came up out of that and against all odds, she became successful and she went on to affect the lives of a billion people in a positive manner. And I laid there knowing what a piece of shit I had become. I laid there knowing what a horrible waste of human space, piece of shit that I had become by my own doing, by Mm -hmm. my own hands. 
And I thought, fuck, man, there's no excuses. Now, I didn't stop getting high. I still kept getting high because I fucking hated myself and I wanted to die. But Oprah is a very extreme example, but there's tons of people that went. There's a guy mm. that I'm, I'm friends with, um, Steve Mihalo, who grew up in foster care. And he doesn't drink a drop of alcohol. He's never done a drug in his life. And I went to India with him to all these different charities that he had started. And he named these charities in his mother's name. And um, I went, I like planted trees with him and met all these orphans that he was housing. And I asked him a lot of questions about his childhood. Mm. I'm like, you know, how did you end up in, in an orphanage? And like, they couldn't afford him. They couldn't afford him and his brother. So they gave him up. They gave him to foster care. And he was a hard egg to crack. He wouldn't tell me what happened, but you know how there's like a conversation behind the conversation. Mm -hmm. He went through some shit. He went through mm. some horrible, horrible shit. And to escape when he was, I think, 16, he lied about his age and he got into the army. And you had two choices. You could go to basic training or you could go to vocational training. And he chose vocational training where he learned how to assemble, I think it's transistor radios. And um, he learned how to build um, intercoms and transistor hmm. radios and all that stuff. And then it and then eventually went off and was a paratrooper and saw action and all that stuff. But anyway, <laughs> Steve Myhalo was a billionaire, and Steve Myhalo donated, I think, thirty five million dollars to Cal State Dominguez in California. And there's like a statue of him. I made him take me there to see it. Um, he built the Steve Myhalo School of Business, mm. and you know, yet again, here's a guy that went through horrible shit, maybe even shit worse than me right? How come he wasn't living under a bridge and shooting heroin and smoking crack and doing petty crimes and selling his body so he could get drug money? Like, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, there's no excuses. And I don't mean to sound harsh, but like, I understand that everything going on in my life was my responsibility. We can talk all day about how horrible yep. my parents were. That has nothing to do with my 30-year-old self. You can talk about your childhood when you're 12, when you're 15, when you're 20. But by the time you're 25 years old, you are capable of going out and earning your own keep and creating a life for yourself and building something and creating a life beyond your wildest dreams, no matter what. I mean, of course, there's exceptions to the rule. You know, there, there, I'm, I'm sure somebody will, will challenge me on that. But mm -hmm. In general, especially if you're born in this country, especially if you're listening to this podcast, you're mm -hmm. probably listening to it on a $1,200 iPhone. <laughs> we got a lot of opportunities here. We got a lot of opportunities and, and, and we can do anything we want to do. So um, the ba back to what you were asking about, like, what is the anxiety or what is the fear about? There's a part of me that thinks about the addiction and I'm still haunted by some of those demons and I'm still scared. You know, we talk about feel free and how I only use it a couple times a week. I have friends that use it every day. We talked about the, the hoppe spray, mm -hmm. which I now am back to using once a week. Um, I gotta be really vigilant, not just with kava or tobacco. What is hoppe is tobacco? tobacco. Right? Yeah. I don't have to just be vigilant with that stuff. I got to be vigilant with popcorn. Hmm. Like I'm not, I'm not even trying to be funny. Like there's, there was popcorn in my pantry. I can't remember the name of it. It's got a Buddha on it. Yeah. It's cooked in avocado. No, it's cooked it's in called popcorn. lesser evil. Okay. Literally lesser evil. Okay. Well, <laughs> it's probably lesser evil if you have one of the eight servings that's in a bag, but yeah. when you bury an entire bag at nine o'clock at night, I've done that too. <laughs> I, I, I can't not do it. Mm -hmm. I was so Taylor, you know, Taylor, my girlfriend. Mm -hmm. So she's back in town now. The two weeks ago when she was out of town, um, was feeling anxious. There's a lot of moving parts going on right now. So I went to home slice. And I didn't want to get the slices to go because I figured by the time I get back here, they're going to be soggy and shitty. And I didn't want to sit outside because it was freezing. This I thought, is pizza, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Home slices pizza. It's the mm -hmm. best pizza in Austin, I would say. Right? From It's really good. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I didn't want to take the, you know, get grab a couple slices to go. I didn't want to sit outside because it's freezing. So 
Um, I just thought, well, I'll go in. What, you know, what's the big deal? And somehow in that 10 seconds from me thinking I was going to grab a couple of slices and go or sit outside and go, here I am ordering an entire large pizza. And I did it without any thought. There was no thought. My mouth was watering. Yep. And I wanted half pepperoni and half cheese, and I wanted it crispy. And the pizza came faster than I expected because they normally take a long time there. Pizza came faster than I expected, and I started eating the pizza. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember getting to like the third or the fourth slice and thinking to myself, wow, I thought you were going to have a couple slices. And then I just blocked that out of my mind, and I kept going. And you know that feeling when you can tell that people are looking at you? I felt that a couple of times while I was eating the pizza and I, I was dipping the crust into the ranch dressing. Oh, yeah. And, you know, <laughs> and then I'm like, the I'm like, I'm being paranoid. People are not looking at me. I'm not that important, right? <laughs> uh-huh. And then all of a sudden, I remember setting down the last piece of crust and it was carnage. I mean, it looked like... Are you saying the, the whole pizza? The entire pizza. Wow. As I'm setting the last piece of crust down and realizing what I've done, I take my napkin to try to like cover the carnage and I shit you not, the super wonderful, loving, attentive waiter walks over and he goes, hey man, I just want to say, like that was really impressive. I'm like, (laughs) people were looking at me. Because one guy sat down and fucking destroyed an entire pizza. So, And they're big. They're big. So I have a very <laughs> compulsive, very addictive personality. And I am not that bright, but I'm smart enough to know that three beers from now, I could be right back to being under a bridge, blowing homeless guys for crack, mm. you know? And I don't want to do that. I've built up an incredible life, but more importantly, I have a responsibility to these beautiful creatures that are wandering around my yard right now. Your kitties. To my to my <laughs> beautiful girlfriend, to my amazing employees, um, to the world. I really truly believe that Sun Life Organics was was put in into the palms of my hand, placed into my lap, and I was smacked on top of the head by divine feminine energy to create nodes like points of light all over the country. You know, we're in Miami now. We're opening up another one here in Austin and Bee Cave. We're all over Southern California. Um, We're going to do Coconut Grove, Palm Beach. I really believe it's my responsibility to deliver the energy that's in these heirloom varieties of cacao beans and the maca that's grown up above 12,000 feet in Mm -hmm. Peru up above Machu Picchu, um, the matcha that comes from the region of Japan that was ruled by the samurai. Like, we think we're going in there and we're getting matchas and smoothies and acai bowls, but what's going on is much, much bigger than that. And it's much, much bigger than me. Yes, I am technically the creator of Sun Life Organics, but just like any real good musician will tell you the truth, they didn't write that song. You're the vehicle for it. I'm the vehicle. I opened myself up, I received. I did a decent job of bringing mm-hmm. it to where it's gotten so far. And I also did a shitty job at times. You know, I didn't know how to run a business. I didn't, it didn't come with an owner's manual. <laughs> yeah. I, I went from like, uh-huh. you know, desperation, survival mode to having hundreds of employees. And, you know, looking back mm. how I conducted myself five, six, seven years ago, like I cringe. I'm like, oh my God. You know, I didn't have a professional stance. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know how to how to run a business. The good news is because the universe, God, divine feminine energy has has provided enough sustenance where I can hire people that do know how to run a business. Mm-hmm. So like Taylor knows how to run the company. Audrey, Hallie, Brad, Jamie, Reagan, like they know how to run the company and they do a far, far better job than I do. And I I like mess around with some recipes. I find really, really, really rich people to give me a bunch of money <laughs> to open up more stores. Mm-hmm. I'm good at that. Um, 
And I'm good at finding good locations. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm definitely not the creator of Sun Life Organics, no more so than Paul McCartney was the creator of the song, Let It Be. Mm. And that song is, is very sacred to me because I lost my mom. And he's not singing about the Virgin Mary. He's singing about his mom in that song. Most people don't know that. And it, didn't it come to him in a dream? Yeah. 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 So just like Sun Life Organics, you know, came to me in, in a lucid dream. The name came to me. Everything just sort of, it, it, it came. And I, I purified myself. I stopped. I resisted the darkness and I walked away from the darkness which then opened me up to the light. And because I was in the darkness so deep and so bad that when I turned towards the light, the light was so bright and so powerful that I was able to manifest much quicker than if I would have been just like a normal dude, mom, dad, dog, cat, dinner at six, you know, type of thing. Um, I suffered the tragedies that I suffered through to form me and mold me into the person that could fulfill my purpose and mm. my destiny. And you feel like, so what you just said, it happened so quickly because you were 33, right? Is what, th- when you got sober. I got sober. Yeah, I was 41 when I started Sun Life. Which is great. Like, because most people think you're done, right? If you haven't, fi- if, if you're a drug addict at 33, people are going to say just like, you're done though. I thought I was done. I thought I was done. I really did. The, uh, yeah. Chris, do you know Chris? Chris. Kind of hangs out. He's, he's, he just got sober five months ago. I probably do, yeah, but I, not off the top of my head. Yeah. So uh-huh. he said, did you know what you wanted to do at five months sober? Because he just turned five months sober today. Mm. I was able to meet up with him and give him a little gift and treat him to a bowl. Cool. And I said, did I, did I know what I wanted to do <laughs> at five months sober? I was 34 years old. Mm-hmm. No, life had passed me by. It was over. I just wanted to like eventually be able to have a, a, a roof over my head and have some food and have a girlfriend. Like that was the only thing I was, I was just, you know, major, um, major survival mode. That was mm-hmm. it. Like I did not think I would be sitting in a multi-million dollar home <laughs> pushing the button <laughs> on the control to lower the lines <laughs> another inch yeah. while we're doing a cool podcast and yeah, just one food. inch, just one inch because yeah, it's in your eyes. Exactly. <laughs> um, no, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I I thought I was done. Everyone thought I was done. I I remember. It's so funny that you brought that mm. up because I was, I was thirty four years old. I was like eight months sober. And I was with this guy named Sean and I was with some other friends and this guy, Sean was super successful. He like owned an advertising agency and he owned like, I can't remember what his other business was. I remember the name of it. I don't want to say, but he was a very, very successful guy worth a couple hundred million dollars, had all these different cars, Ferraris, Lamborghinis, Porsches. Mm -hmm. And I was helping him. I was kind of like acting as his sponsor in a 12 step program. And I had just kind of started to dream again. You know, Mm. I just started to like fantasize about like, well, God, you know, this guy's got this and this guy did this and he came to this country as an immigrant and we do live in the greatest country ever. And, you know, we can all accomplish whatever we want to accomplish. There was a, Another documentary, I like documentaries, um, (laughs) about Sir Anthony Hopkins that I had watched a couple weeks earlier. And it was talking about how he didn't make it until he was 54. He didn't do Silence of the Lambs until he was 54 years old. Really? Yeah. No wonder he's always looked the same in all the films. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So. 54. 54. Could it be be 51, but I think it's 54. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you know, he had studied theater. He was a true thespian. He had given it all he had. He was a fall down, miserable drunk, according to the documentary. And um, he turned his life around and, and what most people consider very late in life, he became a success. So I was kind of talking about like, yeah, I want to like open my own sober living. And, you know, my dream car is like a Range Rover and I'm going to get one one day. And I'll never forget this guy. Um, sorry, this guy, Sean. He looked at me with all sincerity and he said, 
it's too late. And a couple people started laughing. And I was like, This is the rich guy, Sean? Yeah. Okay. And I'm like, What? And he goes, Khalil, it's too late. How old are you? I was like, I'm I'm 34. Wow. I'm, I'm going to be 35 in a couple of weeks. And he's like, no, it, it's too late. He wasn't being a dick. He meant it. Tried to save you the heartbreak, probably. Yeah. And um, I, I found out not too long after that, it was probably days after that, that my mom had cancer. My mom mm. was like 67 years old at the time. And I was staying at that Sean guy's in his guest house on one of his properties because they were doing construction and it was a you know, free place for me to sleep. I had an air mattress and I was homeless. Most people don't know this. I was homeless well, like two years into my sobriety. I was still homeless. I was still crashing on floors of people's houses. I mean, if you really want to get technical, I was homeless. <laughs> 2007 was when I took over the lease at the Bowman's. Yeah, I was I was technically homeless for four years. That was 2007 was when I started to pay them rent so I could turn it into a transitional living. You're 37. Yeah. Yeah. I was 37 years mm. old and still technically homeless. Now, I lived at this really cool property and I did it in exchange for, for I like washed their cars, washed their dogs, did their grocery stop, shopping, like ran errands for them. And they let me crash in the West Wing of the house. <laughs> And slowly over time, like Cindy Landon got me a laptop for my birthday and she gave me the DVD of The Secret. So I started getting into like that mindset. Like I'm not singing the blues. It wasn't like homeless, like at the Salvation Army homeless. I was homeless, you know, living in these rich people's house, but I'll still, <laughs> I didn't, I couldn't afford my own yeah. place and I wasn't paying rent. Um, so anyway, I'm staying in that guy Sean's guest house and I, f- I was at Cafe Marmalade and I got the phone call from my mom. The place in San- or Palisades? Uh, there's one in Palisades. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and my mom told me she had cancer and I just like pushed it down. Like we do as men. Like, oh, okay. Um, and she's like, can you come, can you come visit me? And uh, I'm like, uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll call you soon. And I got off the phone and the Sean guy was like, you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. Mm. And he dropped me off at, at his property that night and the sun was going down and there was no electricity because they were doing construction. And um, I, I had a candle. And as soon as he left, I like went back inside and I, I just started crying yeah. and crying. And then it just kept getting worse and worse. And I started sobbing. And then I started thinking about like all the opportunities that I had as a young man that I blew and all the bridges that I had burned. And I just started crying and got like fucking I went fucking crazy and I started like punching myself in my leg mm. like over and over again as hard as I could because I fucking hated myself so much I hated myself so much for not being able to go back and visit her and not being able to like send her money or help her and I I cried well until the night probably almost till dawn mm. and I just made a vow I made a vow I was like I will never be broke again. I will never be poor again. I will never be in a position where I can't help someone who I love or or help anybody if I want to. Like I will never be like this again. I'm going to fucking work and I'm going to create wealth. I'm going to create abundance for myself and I'm going to go out and I'm going to get it. And yes, I was watching The Secret. Yes, I was reading Think and Grow Rich. Yes, I was <laughs> reading The Science of Getting Rich by uh-huh. Wallace D. Waddles and Psycho-Cybernetics. And like, I, I had them all, but I also got up every fucking day and I went for a walk every day, seven days a week, no matter what. And I did a walking gratitude list. Mm. And first I thanked God for what I had and I'm talking about roof over my head. Because, so, yeah, you started off. You have to think 37 without yes. your own apartment. Mom just got Roof sick. over my head, food in my belly, opportunities in front of me, my sobriety. I had to start out with the basics. Clean water to bathe in, right? Fuck, fuck no electricity. It was sunny outside most days and I had a candle, right? I had to be grateful for that roof over my head. And mm-hmm. I was. And because I developed an attitude of gratitude, I became more likable. People wanted to be around me. So the opportunity for work began to expand. Mm. And work begets work, just like violence begets violence. 
So I went to work and I grabbed on to work like a drowning man seizes a life <laughs> preserver, as they say in 12-step meetings. I literally took any job I could get and any other job I could get and any other job I could get. I was a manny for Billy Bob Thornton for his two boys, Willie and Harry. I was a dog walker for Lou Gossett Jr. and Cindy Landon. I worked at the Malibu Ranch Recovery Center overnight. And most nights, not proud to say this, but most nights I sat upright in a chair and I slept because my job was like to watch the place to make sure it didn't Mm -hmm. burn down. But the truth is I would hand out everyone's meds and I would sit in my chair and I would just sort of like nod out or (laughs) or sleep the whole night. And Mm -hmm. then I would get up in the morning, race over to Luz, walk the dogs, race over to uh, um, Pietra was the mom, the Mm -hmm. ex-wife, clean up all the dog shit. Take the take the dogs on Broad Beach for for the run. Um, if the boys were up and wanted to, and it was sunny, I would take them out boogie boarding, get them back, and then I would have to race home. A lot of times, a lot of times, I would go. I could have just asked them if I could take a shower, but I didn't. I would go to Zuma Beach, and they had showers there, and I would park my shitty old two thousand and uh, or no, it's not two thousand. My shitty old nineteen ninety seven. Volvo with like 250,000 miles on it <laughs> that I was essentially living out of because I was. That was my closet. And that was many nights where I slept. Um, and then I would go to the showers, which were ice fucking cold, but whatever. I had a shower, <laughs> you know? Uh-huh. So sometimes I could stay at places like Sean's guest house, but that didn't end up panning out for a multitude of reasons which I don't want to go into out of respect for him. Um, Sometimes I could crash at girls' houses that I was dating. That typically didn't last too long because that (laughs) arrangement got, you know, pretty old after a while. Um, And then on a more permanent level, at Robbie and Lori's, Robbie was my sponsor and I was able to stay at their house on a a more permanent level. But there, even even there, I still had to be like, if she was awake, because she didn't know I was staying there. Her wife. She didn't. I was like off in another wing of the house. So like if she was downstairs watching TV, I would have to sit outside and wait for that TV to go off. And she watched TV all night sometimes. So a lot of times that Volvo was my my car. But regardless, (laughs) I did my fucking gratitude Uh walks every morning, rain or shine. And I walked those dogs and I took any work that was put in front of me. And I worked at two rehabs at the exact same time. And within a very short period of time, and you know, remember, we're talking about going from living under a bridge to, you know, not living under a bridge. And within a very short period of time, I had a lot of fucking money. I had like thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, At that time, I couldn't get a bank account still. So I had it wrapped up usually in, you know, with rubber bands (laughs) hidden in different places. But yeah, I saved up a lot of money. I started sending my mom money. Um, I opened up my first business as a sober companion and interventionist um, while I was still doing many of those jobs. And then um, I opened up my first actual brick and mortar business, which was Riviera Recovery in 2007. And did you get loans? Like, or equity, or is this your nobody, saved money? No, not then. Nobody would give me money. Yeah. To open Sun Life Organics, I got, yeah. I got, I borrowed money from a guy that um, is not the type of guy that you wouldn't pay back. <laughs> Um, but that's a true story. I mean, I borrowed money from a guy, great guy, super fucking cool guy, but Jersey, like tough guy, bookmaker, you know what a bookmaker is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I borrowed money from a a bookmaker. Um, and I paid him back exactly one year later. Um, you know, I'm just because I'm ambitious doesn't mean I'm not fucking crazy. (laughs) (laughs) I was crazy. Um, Mm. but he had seen me he had seen me working all those jobs and he had seen my ambition and my and my hustle so no riviera recovery i started riviera recovery with my own money um i just took everything i had and i and i threw it at it and i started it on a shoestring and a prayer and it just worked a lot of times the universe really truly is going to conspire with you to make your dreams come true but you got to fucking hustle. You got to work. You, you, you can't just like 
watch The Secret and read Think and Grow Rich and sit on your sofa and imagine yourself driving a Lamborghini. First of all, if you are doing that, you're doing it for all the wrong reasons. Mm. I wasn't I wasn't looking for Lamborghinis. I was looking to not feel like a piece of shit and I wanted to rejoin the human race <laughs> and I wanted to be able to take care of my mom and I wanted to I wanted to help people. Look, did I want a G-Wagon and a Rolex? Of course I did. Of course, all that silly shit was on my original um, vision board. Which now you have both. One on the way. I got, I got <laughs> you know, I will tell you all three vision boards that I did, just like in The Secret, when that guy claims that he ended up living in the house that was actually on his vision board. I didn't, I didn't end up living in the house that I was on my vision board, but... I've got pictures of my original vision boards and you know that toilet that I showed you? <laughs> yeah, so Khalil gave me a tour of his house and there's a really cool spaceship toilet. There's a toilet that looks <laughs> like a spaceship and it it washes your butt for you. Um, we'll leave it at that. But that toilet was on my vision board, my second vision board, my on my first vision board, that was on there. The Rolex? Um, yeah, that that particular model, that was on there. The one that you're wearing? Yeah. The particular model exactly was on there. Same thing. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you what's interesting about that. I eventually realized what a douchebag I was for putting that on my vision board <laughs> and I covered it up. Interesting. I still got it. You still have the vision board? No. I still got the watch. Oh, okay. You covered it up. Even though I watch. covered it up. Like my vision boards were cringeworthy, you know, uh -huh. even though I had good intentions and I wanted to create businesses that would serve people and help people. Um, opening up a recovery center, opening up a juice bar, um, opening up a service where I'm a sober companion, opening up a yoga studio, writing a book to help other people find hope and achieve their dreams. Like my intentions are always good. Mm -hmm. But again, that doesn't mean I'm not a fucking douchebag. That doesn't mean that I'm still well, not, I'm just enjoying life, having fun I'm too. I'm enjoying life, but there, there is a component of me being a highly insecure man, mm. like most men are, but they just, they're not in touch with it, um, <laughs> that wants shiny things because, well, I'll speak for myself. I want shiny things because I think at some point I'll have the right type of shiny things that are going to make that feeling of dread or emptiness inside of me go away. Mm -hmm. And I know you're not supposed to talk about that because all the coaches out here, the life coaches and the, the spiritual coaches and whatever, they have it all figured out and they feel perfect inside and they've all faced their shadows and <laughs> they never have a bad day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to speak for myself. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I still have many bad days and I wake up most mornings feeling quite anxious and I spend quite a few days feeling less than and insecure. And you know what? It's okay. Mm. It's okay. That, it, that, that, is, that, that is what it is. You've ex you, so it sounds like, have you accepted that? Sure. Mm. Sure. I don't, I don't think I'm ever going to arrive at some point where I wake up farting lotus blossoms <laughs> and I walk around in a, in a perpetual state of happiness and bliss and, um, you know, no, this is, this is what it is to be a human being. We are, we are going to experience the full gamut of emotions. And mm -hmm. the reality is, is that most of us, most of the time are going to feel pretty anxious and pretty confused and, slightly depressed and thinking that we need something to fix ourselves. I, I really truly believe that's how most people feel. I know that's how I feel. Mm. I know that's how I feel. So does it just go back? Cause I, um, so is, do your morning practices, is it just simple again? Cause your morning gratitude walks, the sauna, is it, do you, what snaps you out of anxiousness back into feeling free, feeling expansive, loving, most of what you just said, the morning walks and the gratitude and getting the blood pumping and the oxygen going and the sunlight mm -hmm. in my eyes and on my skin, um, working out is, I think, probably the top, top three, like prayer, mm. number one, exercise, number two, nutrition, number three, um, reading, positive stuff, listening to positive stuff. I want to throw meditation in there, but 
I don't want to falsely represent myself because I used mm. to talk about meditation a lot. And I, it's not that I didn't do meditation or that I don't meditate. Mm-hmm. I just can find myself talking about meditation more than I'm actually meditating. <laughs> <laughs> and that goes back to being the insecure male that wants to look cool and spiritual to other people. <clears throat> um, meditation is amazing. And as time goes on and as I achieve, actually not achieve, as I mm. don't have to contend with Maslow's hierarchy any longer, right? Like when there's no more mortgage and there's enough money in the bank that I could stop working and be okay for the rest of my life, as that is unfolding for me, um, I am able to do things like meditate much more easily and much more comfortably than as a 35-year-old guy in survival mode when it seemed like everyone else was living off of second-generation fame or nepotism or generational wealth. And I was the only guy in town that, you know, drove an old beat-up car and had to work four jobs just to put, you know, food in my mouth. Mm. It's a lot easier to meditate now. So I will get into <laughs> more of that spiritual stuff and and hopefully at some point become a a very spiritual man and, <laughs> and have more bliss and more contentment. But I just, I see, I see a lot of people on social media posturing and posing and claiming to have it all figured out. And I don't think we ever get to have it all figured out. Mm-hmm. I have not cornered the market in how to live life. Um, If you're listening to this, if there's anything that you can take away from this is if I was homeless, addicted to drugs, (laughs) without a high school diploma, a convicted felon at 33 years old, when I finally popped my head out of my ass and took responsibility for my life and everything going on in it, if I was able to go from that to where we're sitting now, which is owning an incredible business, employing over 400 people, living in a beautiful home, Mm. being in an an amazing, amazing greatest relationship of my life, Mm. monogamous relationship. (laughs) It's very important for me to say that. Mm -hmm. Um, I've heard a lot of uh, new thought leaders, guru type people, um, talking about poly polyamorous polyamorous relationships and i don't know man they're probably much more spiritual than i am for me <laughs> i got to be with somebody who wants to be with me and i got to want to be with them i'm I, i'm still going to have sexual desires i'm a man god gives me sexual desires to procreate that doesn't mean i don't look at other females and you know have thoughts or or whatever mm-hmm. but like there's nobody on this planet that I would rather spend time with mm. than my girlfriend and my cats and really, most importantly, myself. I love being with me. I love being alone. I Which, Khalil, being- that's a huge thing for you to say because of the self-hatred that you used huge. to have. Huge. Yeah. I really enjoy my own company. And for you, and that's like when you say you're like anxious... And I think it's important for people to know it's like, like it's normal in the world to have, to feel fear, to, you might feel people's energy. You respond, I mean, you're not responsible, but you are responsible, right? For these people's jobs and things like that. Of course I am. Yeah. But it's like, is for you to say that you, cause like when I see you, like I still feel peace within you though. Mm -hmm. There's a ton, Uh there's a ton, but I am. I'm very in touch with who I am and what I feel and what I'm going through, just as I'm in touch with, or I could feel what other people are going through, Mm -hmm. you know? And like, we, we had that situation the other day where we were 30 minutes into a conversation and someone sat down, multiple people sat down next to us and decided to eavesdrop. And one guy decided he was going to take my inventory and attack me. And apparently the other person, and by the way, we don't know that she actually said what. That's true. We don't know that. 
I did feel some strange energy from her, but I feel like she sat down right before I started sharing with you my successes about what kind of car I was going to order or what has gone on in my sex life. That was a private conversation between two men, Mm -hmm. right? She was eavesdropping and it was taken out of context because if she would have listened to the whole conversation (laughs) and knew the backstory, she would have been like, wow, that's interesting, I think. Mm -hmm. But when that guy went off the rails and kept trying to contradict me and make himself look cool, you know, you said, wow, you really don't care what other people think. And I was like, no, I care deeply what other people (laughs) think. But when they're a wounded, broken, shattered human being who's trying to attack me so he can feel better about himself in front of his friends, it's not worth me getting upset. It's not, it's Mm -hmm. not, it's not worth, I could have, I, 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 I don't want to sound like a prick right now, but I mean, I I could have really taken him apart verbally Mm -hmm. and physically. I could have really put him in his place. What would that have solved? Number one, it would have interrupted our flow because we were having such a beautiful moment. And number two, I could recognize that he's hurt. Mm -hmm. He's fucking hurt. It's really simple. If you're, if you're still listening, sorry, I get a little long in the tooth. (laughs) If you're still listening, (laughs) if you love yourself, if you truly love yourself, you're going to love other people. But it goes the other way. If you hate yourself, you're going to hate other people. Mm. So like, if you love yourself and you, you feel like you're living your purpose and you're doing the best that you can, you're going to always see the best in other people. But if you deep down inside fucking hate yourself and, and, and just feel like you're a piece of shit, you're going to look for all the character defects in everybody else. And that's the first thing that you're going to spot in people. So I have to remember when people attack me, because I'm, I am, I'm a target. I make myself a target. Yeah. You, the best word you're, you're polarizing. I am polarizing. (laughs) I dress loudly. I talk loudly. Mm -hmm. I move loudly and with confidence and unapologetically me. And for people who are on the path, for people who are seeking self-improvement and and to better themselves and to create abundance for themselves or to create a career or whatever, people who are on the path of wanting to evolve, they forgive my my character defects. Mm -hmm. They forgive me being pompous or arrogant or presumptuous. Because I got all that shit. I got a (laughs) lot of fucking character defects. I have a lot of character defects. I don't view them as defects, but keep going. You don't view them as defects because you are on a mission to not only evolve yourself Mm -hmm. and to become a better version of yourself, but you want to through... I see you doing it all the time in person with Mm -hmm. people. I watch. I listen. (laughs) You want to help other people evolve Mm -hmm. as well. So you're on this path. And when you see somebody like me, you're going to be less apt to judge what's wrong with me. And you're going to be more apt to look at what is good in me. And at the end of the day, we're just mirrors for one another. It's true. Right? I liked you first time I met you. There was a kinship there. Mm -hmm. You remind me of... uh, You remind me of um, (laughs) Austin... Austin Floyd. You remind me of Austin. Mm-hmm. You remind me of Bo. You remind <laughs> That's me. That's funny. You really do. Because we all hang out. Yeah. You remind me of all, all of those people that are just inherently good mm. and wanting everyone to win. You remind me of Ben. You remind me of Cal. You remind me of Luke's story. Like, these are all people that I love who love people and who love themselves. Mm-hmm. And then there's other people who, who really don't particularly care for themselves and they don't particularly care for a lot of other people. And they're very loud and they're opinionated and they're constantly attacking other people and putting other people down and saying mean things about other people. Those people are just hurt. Do you feel like you've, I mean, has that spectrum of your life back when you were, you know, 30, whatever, and you said you hated yourself 
Did you hate other people too? Oh my God. I, I, <laughs> I, I spent the majority of my day taking other people's inventory and character assassinating other people. I really did. Was it like, because the other day we were talking about victimhood. Was that part of it? So like you were looking for defects about them. So it like kind of, in a way, make your ego feel better. Like yeah, that's part of it. Blow out their candles. So mm. my candle would, would shine. Yep. That That's just like, yeah, that's the way it goes. There, there's some of my employees who know me really well, especially on a corporate level. We have a saying that we use often. I probably use it more than they do, <laughs> but it's what would Rick Rubin do? Because they know Rick because he's a good customer. And I know Rick because he's a friend and I met him as because he was a customer or not, because I'm cool. Like I wasn't, that, that's not somebody that n- normally would want to hang out with me, but I think I gave him enough smoothies that eventually <laughs> he took a liking to me. Yeah. Um, and I know his story. I know where he came from. I know what he's been through. I know that he's been me- meditating. I think we figured out the math yesterday. He's been meditating twice a day for a minimum of 20 hours, 20, sorry. 20, 20 hours. 20, <laughs> Jesus. He's been meditating twice a day for a minimum of 20 minutes each day, every day. And I asked him, I'm like, come yeah. on, every day? And he's like, yes. <laughs> I'm like, yes. you've been meditating every day. And he's uh-huh. like, yes. <laughs> For 45 years. So what would Rick Rubin do? Like, if Rick Rubin was having a conversation with you mm. and, and Mr. Smarty Pants, who desperately wanted to try and make me look bad. Remember how he was like, yes, yes, yes. What are you saying? And what are you talking about? He like completely jumped in our conversation. Mm -hmm. If Mr. Smarty Pants tried to do that with the Rick Rubin, Rick wouldn't have even turned to to look at him. Rick would have continued with this conversation. Right? If, If someone were to try to verbally attack him, he would literally smile or he would just get up and he would walk away because he feels whole and he feels complete. And it's not just the meditation. Let's be honest. He's one of the most iconic, amazing music producers in the history of mankind Mm -hmm. and has done, you know, whether it's Adele or Eminem or, I mean, he, he crosses over every genre of music and he is literally iconic. So he's iconic. He is super into meditating. And he's really into health and wellness and nutrition. And he puts good stuff in his body. And he doesn't watch television. And um, I always want to try and think about, in challenging moments for myself, how would Rick Rubin react? Mm-hmm. Because that will teach me that I have to continue to grow and evolve so I can get to the point where I can be like that. Where shit mm. just doesn't matter, right? It means nothing. So somebody's been ripping us off on our inventory, on the invoices, and they've been overcharging. We do, what the fuck? What do you mean? And blah, blah, blah. Like, for what? For what? Because that, what does that actually do? Yeah. How about don't work with that vendor anymore? <laughs> Find another vendor, uh-huh. be more mindful in the future, and go enjoy your day. Because here's mm-hmm. what's going to happen. And I thought about this the other day when I was watching David, Char- uh, Dave, yeah, David Charvet. David Charvet was doing a, a workout. You don't know who David Charvet is because you're much too young. But David Charvet <laughs> was an actor on Baywatch when he was a young kid. He was like in his early 20s. Mm-hmm. He was a model. He was an actor. I think he, he did some music. David Charvet was so strikingly handsome and good looking and came from a good, you know, wealthy family. His father was, his father manufactured denim. I believe that's where their family fortune came from. And people could not stand the fact that he was a famous actor on this big, big television show at the time. So people talk shit about him like a lot. I remember, I remember seeing him at Cross Creek and every time he would like, you know, people, oh, fuck that guy. His dad bought him his career uh. or, you know, like his dad had connections, which I highly doubt. I highly doubt that's true, but let's say it is true. No one has ever gotten a connection through their father or their family. Like who cares? Even if mm. it was true, 
But here's the interesting thing that I thought of. Here's David Charbonnet. He's 50. I think David's probably 53 years old now. Shredded. Absolutely. One of the most <laughs> perfect bodies on a man I've ever seen at his age. Uh -huh. Ridiculously good looking. Like Rob Lowe, good looking. Like <laughs> okay. Brad Pitt, good looking. Uh -huh. has, has this amazing career. He doesn't act. He stopped acting decades ago. Um, but he has this amazing career. He's got this clothing line. He's got these great friends. He's an amazing dad. Um, he, David has been living for the last 30 years that I've known him. He's been living this incredible, big, wonderful, amazing life. And the people that were all talking shit about him sitting at Coffee Bean <laughs> wound up having shit lives. And Ben, I mean that literally. And I almost was one of those people. And for mm. many years, I was one of those people. I had a shit life for many, many years. Mm. And so one day I woke up and I took responsibility for my own life. And here's the craziest thing about this story. Because I was one of the people that talked shit about David Charvet. I was. I was so jealous of him. Yeah, jealousy. And I went through a crisis a couple of years ago. Um, and I, and I ended up becoming friendly with him when I opened up Sun Life. He started coming in. I'm like, oh God, this fucking guy still looks amazing. <laughs> he looks even better now. Like his body's even better than it was when he was a famous actor. And he was so nice. And I think his, yeah, his daughter ended up working there for a while. And he was just always so helpful. Like, do you, you know, do you need this or do you need that? Or you want me to introduce you to the owner of Soho House? Do you want to get a membership there? Like he was just always going out of his way to help me. So I, I really took a liking to him. Mm. And I never told him like, hey, dude, I used to talk a bunch of shit about you, right? But I definitely mm -hmm. thought about it a lot because it was a great lesson for me because number one, I was talking about a shit about a guy who's a fucking great guy mm -hmm. and a great dad and just a great friend, number one. Number two, did me talking shit about him have any impact whatsoever on his life and his happiness? Like, that's the thing that we have to remember. If we want to attack people and talk shit about people, they're still going to be going off and living amazing lives. And even if we're talking shit about somebody who's not doing great things with their life, what fucking purpose does it serve? What we put out is what we receive. Mm. And back to what ultimately ended up happening a couple of years ago when I went through a little, I went through a difficult time a couple of years ago. My mom was sick. My mom was in the process of, I had to put her in a home and she was, a, she was they were about to bring in hospice and um, went through a little bit of a crisis and my phone rang and I looked at my phone and it said David Charvet and I was like, mm -hmm. how would I have to, and I'm like, oh my God, I remember, yeah, when his daughter worked for me, he had given me his number. He said, if you ever need anything, never hesitate to, to reach out to me. And I'm like, hello? It's like, hey, Khalil, it's David Charvet. I'm like, hey, David, like, <laughs> how are you? I'm like, uh, I'm okay. And he's like, no, really, man, how are you? And I'm like, honestly, I'm, I'm fucking hurting and blah, blah, blah. He ended up spending like an hour on the phone with me. And he could not have been more kind and more loving and more encouraging. And here's the crazy thing. Had I never sobered up, and found my own success and found my own peace and found my own love and acceptance of myself, I never would have realized that one of the very people who I was so bitterly jealous of, which I didn't know at the time, I didn't know I was jealous of him when I was a mm -hmm. fucking idiot 20-year-old guy, or tw I was like 27, actually, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say, <laughs> maybe even 28. Um, I didn't realize how jealous of it was at the time, but had I not evolved myself, I would have missed out on the friendship and I would have mm. missed out on the realization that making disparaging remarks about anybody is never going to do any good for anyone or anything. Like there's a, there's a, a, a news lady from LA who reached out to me a month ago, Christina, we'll, we'll leave her last name out of it, but she had a bad experience at one of my shops. Uh. And she DM'd me 
And I read the DM and it was like really long. And I'm like, my God, this woman took time out of her day to let me know that she had a bad experience. Why? Because she wanted me to fix it because she loves the brand and she loves my story. And so I thought about that versus somebody going on Yelp and just decimating uh. my brand, right? Every restaurant you go into, I don't care if it's Nobu or if it's the local pizza joint, everyone's going to have a bad day. Every waiter is going to have a bad day. Every chef's going to have a bad day. Every business is going to have a bad day. If we tear them down, what purpose does it serve? But if we lift them up, mm. if we go out of our way to help them, it serves the higher purpose, with, which ultimately serves all of us. Which I completely agree with. And I'm interested to even just flip that like on, on yourself almost. Like what if it's, what if the, disparaging comments are about self. Which I do often for humor. <laughs> I definitely make yeah. fun of myself. Yes. Um, and make disparaging remarks about myself. I, I, I have been... Chase asked me to stop doing it. I think you stop asking me to do it. Cal told me to lighten up on myself. Mm. And Bill Rancic said, mm. hey man, don't talk like that about yourself. You're a great guy. Which I love that. How cool is that? Just so many loving men. Wow, I just got chills. That's so cool. That's in Austin though. Yeah. That would not happen in, let's just say, other cities. <laughs> There's something uh -huh. magical going on in Austin where we're, mm -hmm. we're coming together as men and we're helping one another heal and we're helping one another evolve and where we're helping one another, you know, with, with whatever. Doesn't mean it's perfect, but it's still more transformative than anything than I've seen. I've never felt anything like it. I've been all over the world. I spent five years traveling all over the world um, to some of the most exotic places. Did he mess it up? No. Oh. Um, <laughs> and uh, my cat just walked on uh, on Ben's keyboards, which or uh, keyboard, uh, laptop, which he <laughs> often does. Um, I've never felt anything like this. Listen, I can live anywhere I want. I mean... It sounds braggadocious and, and you know pretentious. No, it's the truth, it's and the that's truth. and that's your freedom and what you've built and manifested, cultivated. Yeah. It's amazing. I can live anywhere I want. I uh -huh. mean, my my plan was to move to Miami and semi-retire and um, not open up any more stores. And the universe, God, divine feminine energy, had different <laughs> plans. Uh -huh. um, the person running this location quit. We had to come here because Taylor helps to run the company, so she had to come here and fix it. And I was here like a week, exactly one year ago, exactly one year ago. Beginning of December? Last week. Uh, last week. Oh, we, got, wow. we got here, we got here November 23rd, I think. Wow. Yeah. And uh, it was freezing and it was miserable <laughs> and people didn't know how to drive. <laughs> and I was frustrated. And within like a week, the knots in my stomach began to undo themselves. And the tension in my sternum and my solar plexus began to... This disappear. is in general, not just what Austin made you feel. You're saying in a week, your general being started to lighten. Yes. I was walking along the river every day. And uh, I had such a beautiful experience. It almost seems like a dream now. And I wish I knew how or why. But not once, not twice but multiple times, and I think it's because of the Skinny Confidential podcast, multiple times people would literally, as they were running by, they would see me and they would light up uh -huh. and they would come over and they would hug me. Wow. I have no fucking idea why. <laughs> um, yeah. People smiled at me. And... My girl, you know, Taylor was like, well, we should just move here. And I'm like, huh. oh, I don't even fucking live in Texas. <laughs> so I'm like, Texas? Yeah. And she's like, it's great here. And then within a couple of weeks, we started looking at houses. And then we moved into the Line Hotel. And uh, even, even going through the big freeze, even, you know, all that weirdness, I just felt something here. And then it thought up. I got invited by um, David Nurse to Cal Callahan's house. Mm -hmm. And I walked into that room of, you know, Kyle Kingsbury and, and Luke Story and David Nurse and 
um, all these amazing, you know, mm-hmm. uh, Austin Floyd and all these amazing men. There's a young kid that recovered from a brain tumor. Mm. Uh, do you know what his mm-hmm. name is? He he comes in every day. He was there. There was just all these amazing men there, and um, yeah, my my journey of transformation at 51 years old <laughs> began. They took me out to uh, what was it called? What was Cal's the bunker? They took me out mm-hmm. to the bunker. And they handed me a kettlebell, and I was like, "What the fuck is this?" <laughs> You've never seen it. <laughs> I mean, you I never saw. saw a I saw like those guys on Instagram <laughs> yeah. doing what I thought was so self indulgent, and yeah. stupid, just swinging it, and yeah. yeah, I'm like, that's so dumb. <laughs> Little did I know that it's uh-huh. called functional fitness. <laughs> Little did I know that my uh-huh. workouts were dumb and causing me injury and harm. And and to mm. use these kettlebells and steel maces and ropes climbing to the ceiling and doing these goblet squats and doing these box jumps and doing these bear crawls, all of that stuff would eventually transform me into. I I, I feel like I feel so powerful. Mm. That's another part of the level of comfort and the self actualization is the physical health as well. So, um. Yes, it's cool. I'm I'm experiencing <laughs> a, a metamorphosis yet again at a very late stage in life. Most people would consider. I mean, I don't know. I don't feel old. No, dude, it's like yeah, it's a number. Yeah. Um. Sometimes now I, I look in the mirror and I'm like, oh fuck, I better get a little Botox and get in the Sean Penn forehead. <laughs> uh, the, the, the forehead yeah. seems to be getting bigger as time goes by. Uh-huh. But um, <laughs> oh man, I'm so happy. I'm I'm so happy. I love what I do. Um, I love meeting people like yourself. I'm going to hop on a jet tomorrow and fly down to Cabo and go snorkeling and just do all kinds of cool stuff and head back down to Miami after that to not just tend to the new shop that we opened there in South Beach, but to also find a location in Coconut Grove and um, and a few other places down there to open up more stores. So it's really good, man. It's really good. Life is really good. Like, How does it feel to say that? It feels really fucking cool. Because what, as I'm saying it… <laughs> I'm, I'm getting thinking, a little emotional too. I'm, I was like, I'm thinking about really cool. young men like you mm. and women that are listening to this that are mm. going to go on my Instagram page or they're going to look up my book or they're going to yeah. look up and they're going to go, wait a second, if that fucking guy <laughs> can do it, mm-hmm. I can do it. And that's all I want. I want people like you. Mm-hmm. How old are you, by the way? 30. Almost 31. 31. Okay. I want people and and Taylor, just not my Taylor, but you know Taylor that does the cacao series. Uh-huh. Wow, talk about another amazing. And she's movie. side note, we're actually collabing on something later. She, she is a goddess. <laughs> she is so powerful and she uh-huh. is so amazing. And she doesn't need to prove it. And that's to me, that's what makes you more powerful. And I've been working that on myself is like powerful without the necessity to prove it. Yeah. I still want to humble brag. I still <laughs> I still want to impress people. Um, I still me want too. some likes. Um <laughs> but to know that um to know that there are people listening right now, hopefully they have the stamina to to <laughs> to, to listen to this long-winded diatribe and dissertation. Um people are listening now going, wait a second, a dude that didn't have high school diploma, still don't have high school diploma. You know, that didn't have any skills, that didn't have any family, nothing to fall back on. At 41 years old, opened up this brand. At at 46 years old, wrote a book, <laughs> right? Like at 52 years old, is in the greatest shape of his life. Yes. There's no excuses. You and Taylor and my Taylor mm-hmm. and Dakota and all of these people that are part of this great awakening. This is a great awakening. You know, Cal has the podcast, The Great Unlearn. Mm-hmm. We are unlearning so we can awake. We're going to awaken and and we are going to be the example and we are going to change the world. We're going to change the world. I know that's a tall order and I know I probably sound like a bit of a pompous asshole for saying <laughs> that, but I'm, no. I'm serious. We're going to make people help themselves to become healthy and happy. And for anybody listening, please join us. Please write that book, write that script, make that movie, move, 
Go find another job. Get out of that relationship that is holding you back and holding mm. that other person back. Call your mom and tell her you love her <laughs> every day because someday she's not going to be there. Call your dad, I guess. I don't call my dad, but <laughs> if you get along with your dad, call your dad, tell him you love uh -huh. him. Like, do whatever it is that that you feel inside of you that is your that is your purpose. And mm. and put your phone down and go jump in a river, jump in a stream, jump in a lake, jump in the ocean, go hike that mountain, go become the man or the woman that God intended you to become. Boom. And yeah, I just that's so beautiful. And like I just want to point out because of where we started, right? About asking about anxiety. And just, but just to point out of like, it's more than just gratitude. Khalil, you're, like, you're starting to embody it. Maybe not starting. I feel like you already are of like the joyful. And I, the feeling that I get is like that fear or anxiety, even though it's there, I, that feels old to me. Yeah. That doesn't feel like who you are. Yeah. It's not, I mean, there's still some of it in there. Yeah. I, I don't think it's ever going to fully go away. Yeah. I mean, we're human. We're human. And you know what? <laughs> Fear and anxiety has built me a fucking empire. <laughs> so I'm not hating on it. I'm not, I mean, I don't want to like feel fearful and anxious all the time. Mm. And most days I feel incredible. Yeah. Most days I feel incredible. Not most mornings. Mornings are tough for me. So, mm. um, but most days, if I do a little bit of effort, a little bit of positive, you know, you see my, all the books everywhere and the podcasts <laughs> and the crystals and the, if I do a little bit of work on myself in the morning, I can usually wind up if I put some good food into my body and some clean water into my body and develop an attitude of gratitude. I'm, I'm pretty fucking happy. Mm. I'm pretty happy. And there are many days where I'm walking around feeling like I can shoot lightning bolts from the palm <laughs> of my hands. So <laughs> Life is good. So thanks you feel thank you feel free for providing yeah those but no I mean it, it comes from within of Joke, jokes but aside. things like feel free can help <laughs> and things yes. like that that spray uh -huh. you know that that's a great tool going to uh -huh. see people like Kimmy um being around people like Adam von Rothfelder you know strong coffee guy and having him like help me to move and to bear crawl and to you know, surrounding yourself with positive people, all that stuff. It is an inward journey. It mm -hmm. is an inward journey. But surround yourself with amazing people and put good food in, into your body and put good thoughts into your head and and forget everything you've ever known and watch what happens. I love that. So I feel like the moral of the story was like, it's never too late. No, of course not. And that's a great, I love that. I love being that guy mm -hmm. that that can preach that message and embody that message. It's never too late. You know, most of you guys are probably under the age of 52, I would imagine if you're listening to this. So <laughs> get off your ass, take responsibility for everything that's going on. Stop beating up on your mom and dad. Maybe they were shitty parents, but you know what? They did the best that they could, you know, just go, go, go and fucking go do epic shit, man. <laughs> go do epic shit. I love it. Well, Cleo, like, I appreciate you. Thank you for sharing your time with us. Yeah. Your love. Is there anything else on your heart that you feel called to share? Um, if you guys want, you can follow me on Instagram at Khalil Rafati. Still desperate for likes. <laughs> <laughs> G-Wagon's on its way. Oh, yes. Still desperate for likes. <laughs> so pathetic. Um, if you want to read more about my story, you can, um, you can check out my book, I Forgot to Die. Um, available on Amazon. Yeah, also, go like because we we like like literally barely just, yeah, yeah. Barely scratch the surface. Mm -hmm. Check out my book. I forgot to die. If you want to know like the dark drug memoir, hellish existence, <laughs> and then um, the <laughs> newer book, I would suggest you got to read the first one first because the new one is more of like a how to, but the new one's not that good unless you know the previous story. And look, the truth is, if you see me in a sunlight organics, just walk up to me. I'll give you my book. I'll give you my books. I don't care. <laughs> the truth I'll is, treat yeah. you to a smoothie. <laughs> I don't like, I just want yeah. people to be happy and healthy. Which is cool. And that's what I feel like makes you successful. Thank you. And the business and everything. Because again, it, it is just really like, like health is first. Happiness is first. 
like more than just trying to make a buck. Yeah. Um, last question actually is what do you, do you have like a plan for the future or do you feel like you are still going back to like the vehicle of like, it's just step after step or do you have like a what's next? My, so one year ago today, 100%, like I was going to shut down. I had, I had just shut down four locations, brought it down to 10. Because the pandemic. Yeah. Because the pandemic. Yeah. Um, and I, I was thinking I want to shut down this store as well. And so grateful you didn't. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Um, my plan a year ago was to really downsize the company to about five or six stores and just retire and, and let the amazing women who run the company run the company. And I don't know, just like go paddle boarding and hiking and do mm. yoga. That was my plan. So Today, now that we've opened <laughs> two or three <laughs> stores opposite. in the last year yeah. and we're opening like three or four stores in the next year, I can't honestly tell you I have a plan. I definitely don't have an exit strategy. Mm. I could have sold the company many times for more money than I would know what to do with. But I really love what I do. I mm. love like, you know, you've seen me enough to know <laughs> that like, when I get to treat you to a smoothie or treat you to an ice matcha latte or treat, you know, someone like a Nicole, Nicole, a Taylor who I just met to a smoothie, um, or I get to hang out with Austin or like, it fills me with joy. Like it lights me up. I can be in the worst, most anxious, depressed mood ever and walk in and have Lexus behind the counter, like crack a joke about my outfit and all of a sudden I'm in the best mood ever, you know, mm. or have someone walk in that I haven't seen in a long time, you know, get a bear hug from Kyle Kingsbury or get a high five and a fuck. Yeah. From uh, Austin Floyd or, you know, like I love what I do. So my plan is just to keep doing what I'm doing, but I want more people to be able to experience it. So I probably will explore expansion. Sorry about that obnoxious noise. That's my cat who found her toy mouse. <laughs> um, that's it. <laughs> I love it. Well, Khalil, thank you truly just, I mean, for having me in your home and opening, uh, yeah, just like opening your heart truly. Of course. Like I appreciate it a lot. Anytime, always. You know Oof. how to get a hold of me. You text me in the morning, we record yeah. in the afternoon. Boom. I love it. Thank awesome. you, brother. All right, man. Thank you.